Hey everybody, this is Anthony with VR Game Rankings and welcome to a special episode of our daily vlog series. This is episode 65. Now I know what you're wondering, what is the deal? Anthony does not upload episodes on the weekend. And yeah, that is the normal situation, but that's why this is a special bonus episode. Okay, so I wanted to do this episode for two major reasons. Number one, I wanted to wear my Seattle Seahawks t-shirt because my team, the Seattle Seahawks, they are playing for their playoff lives today. They need to win their game against the Arizona Cardinals. And then we also need help from the Carolina Panthers. We need them to knock off the Atlanta Falcons. If both of these things can happen, the Seattle Seahawks can sneak into the playoffs and so it's something that I'm hoping for. So I thought, hey, maybe wearing this t-shirt, I could give my team just a tiny bit of luck. I know it's kind of crazy, but you know what? Who the hell knows? Let's go ahead and give it a shot, right? Okay, and then the other reason is I kind of have an OCD situation. Yeah, I'm talking about obsessive compulsive disorder. Now, I have to say there was a show that I missed. I don't know if it was November or December. I missed an episode of this show. And ever since then, my show numbers have been off, I felt, by one show. It's it's not ending on this even show. You know, I do episodes Monday through Friday, which is five days, and everything was ending on this five-day thing, and everything was good. I miss one day, screwed everything up. So I want to get my episodes back in order. So by having this extra episode... I make up for the episode I missed and I can get my numbers back in order from an OCD standpoint. And then the third thing is I thought it would be kind of fun just to do an off-topic episode. Yeah, if you're interested in VR news and notes, I'm sorry, there is no VR on this episode period. In fact, there's no VR at all. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, this is VR Game Rankings. This is a YouTube channel all about VR gaming. Why are you not talking about VR? Well, I thought I could do something a little bit different with this episode. Again, this is just a bonus episode. It's not going to appeal to everybody. But for people that have been subscribed to this channel, and if you've watched a lot of episodes of this uh, daily vlog, I thought it might be a cool idea to take a look at my gaming history up until when I got VR. So kind of my background in the world of video gaming. And I thought this might be a cool idea from the standpoint that if somebody comes to this show at some point in the future and they're listening to various shows and they're, they don't really have a good idea of where is this guy coming from? Well, they can go to this episode, episode 65, this off-topic episode about Anthony's gaming history. And so they could watch this episode and they might get an idea of my entire gaming history and kind of where I am. Where am I coming from? What kind of point of view do I have? And um, so I just thought this would be kind of cool. Also, as far as the topic goes, my gaming history, I mean, I know my gaming history by heart. I don't have to take any special notes. I don't have to do any special research. I know my gaming history like the back of my hand, so I can walk you guys through that. So basically, that's what I'm going to try to do. And what I kind of wanted to do is I'm basically going to try to spend around eight minutes on three different parts of gaming history. And the first part is going to be old school. The second part is going to be kind of 90s and real early 2000s. And then the third part is going to be kind of modern gaming up to the point of me getting VR. So so basically what this show is all about is my gaming history before VR. Now again, I like I said, you guys, some of you might not give a damn about this, and I totally understand that. No big deal. I'll see you guys on episode 66 on Monday with regular VR talk. For the rest of you, go ahead and kick back and let's go through some gaming history. Okay, so where does it all start? For me, it starts back in the late 70s. In the late 70s, I was a young lad, and my dad, one day, I, I believe it was Christmas. Now, I think this was Christmas of 1977, but it might have been Christmas 1978. We got an Atari 2600 or an Atari VCS 
for Christmas. And that was my first video game console of all time. And oh my God, so magical just to think back to the late 70s, I would be there with my brother and we would be playing Atari. You know, we'd be playing Asteroids. We'd be playing Defender. We'd be playing the crappy Pac-Man game that everybody thinks is absolutely god-awful. Um, games like Adventure and games like Night Driver and just all the different Atari classics that we played way back in those days. And and I also remember playing head-to-head -head with my brother in a lot of sports games, Atari Baseball the Atari football that only had three little guys moving around on the screen. We would play that for hours and hours. So basically, it really started with the Atari in the late 70s. And you might be asking yourself, well, what about the arcades? I mean, this is the arcade time as well, right? Yeah, I did go to arcades, but I wasn't an arcade kid, so to speak, okay? I would spend some time in the arcades, but I wasn't an arcade junkie. Like you guys might have seen Stranger Things season two in the in the very first episode. They spend a lot of that episode in the arcade and they're playing like Dig Dug and stuff. I actually really wasn't that kind of a kid. I would play in an arcade every now and then. Like my parents would go on a trip and we would go somewhere and maybe they would have an arcade and they would be like, hey, Stay in this arcade for a couple hours. We'll pick you up later. You know, that sort of thing. And I would play Crystal Crystal Castles. Crystal Castles was one of my favorite arcade games back in the day. Of course, I also loved Miss Pac-Man. I loved Galaxian and Galaga. Those were uh, some of my favorite all-time arcade games. So I did spend some time in the arcades. But when we got that Atari, that was it, man. That was what I liked. I liked the idea of... Let me play a game in the comfort of my own home. And so I was kind of more into that than I was into the arcades. So for a long time, I just had this Atari 2600, and that was the main thing that we had. Now, we knew other kids that had an Intellivision or some other kid that had a ColecoVision. And we were like, oh, man, they got the Intellivision. They got the ColecoVision. ColecoVision has the best Donkey Kong, you know, all that sort of thing. But we never ended up getting an Intellivision. We never got a ColecoVision. But what we did get, this was, I think, around 1982. Um, we got an Atari 800XL computer. Okay, my dad got this for our family. And it's funny, I mentioned the other day that sometimes parents will buy this big major gift and they'll say, yeah, this is for the whole family. Everybody can use it. You can use it to do your homework. You know, you know that whole lie that we all tell ourselves every time we buy something like that. And my dad got an Atari 800XL computer, which was really expensive at the time. I don't know how much it was in like modern day dollars, but I know it was super expensive because it was a big deal. I don't think my mom was actually too happy about his decision to make this purchase. But I remember playing with this Atari 800XL. I even remember writing some very simple programs on the Atari and, and basically making the screen flash different colors and stuff. I remember writing this one little game where it would ask questions. And if you said yes or no to the question, you know, a little different thing would happen. And just these super basic things. It's funny, too, because I think back to those days and I think, man, if I had really stuck with that, like if I had really gotten into that like super deep and stuck with it, I'd probably be a video game programmer and I probably would have already made a whole bunch of video games and done some incredible stuff as far as as far as that goes. But I didn't really stick with it very much. And honestly, I remember playing a game called Blue Max on my Atari 800 XL and, and that's mostly what I did with that Atari 800XL is play this game called Blue Max. Okay, so that was my earliest memories in the video game world. And then basically the next big time video games came into my world is when I got a Nintendo Entertainment System. Okay, this was, I think this was Christmas 1986, probably, is when we got the Nintendo Entertainment System. And my mom got it for me as a gift. And, you know, I, I wasn't like a hardcore 
video game junkie at this time, but I still played the Nintendo quite a bit. I remember playing games like Ninja Gaiden, Ninja Gaiden, I guess is actually, I called it Ninja Gaiden back in those days, but Ninja Gaiden is how it's pronounced. I remember playing Track and Field 2. Oh my God, me and my buddies played uh, Konami Track and Field 2. We played that thing so much doing the archery and doing the 100 meter dash and the hurdles and like the long jump and all that stuff. We loved that. And we would always try to get better scores in that and compete against each other. I remember playing Bases Loaded and Tech Mobile and Rygar. And, and these were some of the Nintendo Entertainment System classics. Obviously, of course, Super Mario Brothers. I mean, I remember playing that. I mean, that was so awesome. And so I had a Nintendo Entertainment System, but I really wasn't a, a big time video gamer at this time. And then what happened, this was a number of years later. I moved out of my house and I was living in an apartment. I had my Nintendo Entertainment System with me and I still played the Nintendo Entertainment System. But I remember there was this one day I went to a Walden Books at a uh, at a mall and they had these video game magazines there. And I had never seen a video game magazine in my entire life, didn't know anything about them. And I saw this video game magazine. I think it was Game Pro. And I just happened to pick it up and thumb through the magazine, and I saw pictures of the Sega Genesis and the TurboGrafx-16. And these were supposedly these brand new systems that were about to come out. I had my Nintendo Entertainment System, and I wasn't really tripping on buying any kind of a new gaming system. But for some reason, I ended up back at that mall and looking at another magazine and seeing more pictures of games for the Sega Genesis and also for the TurboGrafx-16. And so one day I decide, you know what, I'm going to buy one of these new high-end video game machines. And so I decided to sell my Nintendo. I sold it in the classified ads, all my Nintendo games, all my extra controllers, everything, got a good pile of money for all this stuff. And then I took that money and I went to Montgomery Wards and I was going to buy myself a Sega Genesis. So I get to the Montgomery Wards and I'm like, yeah, I want a Sega Genesis. The guy's like, you know what? We're all sold out of the Sega Genesis. I'm so sorry, but we do have the TurboGrafx-16. And at this time, I was like 50-50 on should I get a Genesis or a TurboGrafx. I ended up buying a TurboGrafx, which was the wrong choice at that time, but I didn't know any better. And I got a TurboGrafx-16, and I remember I got World Class Baseball, I got Power Golf, and I and Dungeon Explorer, and I was playing these incredible uh, TurboGrafx-16 games. In fact, I was so into it that I wanted to improve my picture quality. I wanted to improve my sound quality, and this is something that I've always been into as a gamer, always trying to push it to that next level get the best possible picture quality, the best possible sound quality. And the Turbo Graphics had this thing called a Turbo Booster that you could buy for it. You snapped it onto the back of it and it added composite video and legitimate stereo audio. And I went out, I got that, and then I realized my TV doesn't have a yellow plug on the back of it or a red and white plug. So I went to an electronics store and I bought myself a stereo TV and stereo TVs were like a new thing, man. It was like you had to have like a high end TV to get a stereo TV. Like hardly anyone had a stereo TV, but I bought a cheapo one, got this stereo TV. And I remember hooking my turbo graphics up to it and hearing the sound and seeing crystal clear picture for the first time. It was super awesome. So started off with the turbo graphics. Later on, I ended up getting myself a Sega Genesis. And then when the Super Nintendo came out, at the launch of the Super Nintendo, I bought a Super Nintendo on day one. I remember playing Super Mario World. I remember playing Pilot Wings. I remember playing F-Zero. The Super Nintendo is one of the loves of my life. Like, I'm just going to be straight up honest and tell you, if I had to say what my all-time favorite video game machine is, and I've had so many favorites over the years, so many, but the Super Nintendo is without question my number one favorite gaming machine. And man, I was in love with the Super Nintendo. I still had a Sega Genesis, and I would play games like Kid Chameleon, and I'd play games like Sonic the Hedgehog, 
But man, was I playing my Super Nintendo. Super Mario World is one of my favorite games of all freaking time. Just an incredible game. I love Contra 3. I love Axelay. Uh, Castle, Super Castlevania. Oh my goodness. Super Castlevania was incredible. So many incredible games on the Super Nintendo over the years. I remember when Donkey Kong Country came out and it just was like, dude, look at the graphics. Donkey Kong Country looks so freaking amazing. So anyway, I was mostly this 16-bit gamer guy with a Genesis and a Super Nintendo and played a lot of that. But I jumped on the Sega CD bandwagon when the Sega CD came out. I jumped on that. And I remember you guys with VR, one of the things that we're experiencing right now with VR, I've gone through a history of this shit. I know when we're jumping on brand new bandwagons that people are not aware of. And the Sega CD was very much like this. Like it was a whole new world seeing what was going on on the Sega CD. You guys might think of Night Trap which recently came out on PlayStation 4. They've actually had an enhanced version of Night Trap that you can get. I played Night Trap the day it came out, and it was freaking incredible. I thought it was amazing. This is video, you know, real-time video. Now we look back at a lot of those Sega CD games, and we think they're absolute garbage, and they had no real interactivity, but they were pushing boundaries. They were doing things that we hadn't seen before. Video games was crossing over into this world of multimedia and the Sega CD was probably uh, ahead of its time. You know, we weren't really ready for that kind of technology yet. And then eventually when the PlayStation came out in 1995, that's when that kind of technology was more mainstream. Now, obviously we ditched the whole full motion video idea, but we started to get games that had intricate soundtracks and cinemas and, and things that were going on in the game that made it uh, a higher impact experience. And that was the beginning of that. So, you know, I had a Sega CD, Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis. I was loving things. But, you know, the next system I got was an Atari Jaguar. I, I, I'm one of these habitual early adopters. I always jumped on the bandwagons of brand new systems. I was always looking for that next incredible next level dream that was going to come along and and every new video game system that would come down the pipe had the opportunity to present something new something incredible something i've never seen before and i was always on this quest for the ultimate audio visual experience and i remember when i got my atari jaguar now a lot of people might talk a ton of smack about the atari jaguar but i played cybermorph in December of 1993, and let me tell you, that shit was about as next level as it gets. It was this go anywhere game. You were in this like little ship, little hovercraft game. You could go anywhere. You could hover over these planets. Now, if you play the game now, you see ridiculous amounts of pop in, but we didn't really notice that back then. We were so blown away by the fact that you could just fly your ship in any direction and continue forever. And it was so amazing. And that was Cybermorph. I remember playing Doom. This was in 1994. You know, we're all playing Doom VFR now. My very first experience with Doom was in 1994 on the Atari Jaguar. That's where I played Doom. And when I played Doom on the Jaguar, there was no music. It was only sound effects. It was atmospheric sounds. It was gunshots. It was the grunts. And, and the noises of, of uh, fireballs being shot at you. But there was no background music. And that's my experience of Doom. That's where I played Doom. I remember Aliens vs. Predator on the Jaguar. That was awesome. And then we get to the PlayStation era. I had a PlayStation and I had a Sega Saturn. We talk about Wipeout Omega Collection. I mentioned in that episode when it was announced... That Wipeout is a special game to me, and it's special because that Christmas season of 1995, I got Wipeout. You want to talk about next generation? You want to talk about AAA and taking things to a new level? Wipeout was incredible. I really felt, I remember I was living in an apartment at the time, and I felt like me in my apartment playing Wipeout on my PlayStation was better than anything they had in the arcade. Like, I couldn't believe that I was sitting in my own apartment 
just chilling in my own apartment with my PlayStation controller and playing Wipeout. And I felt like the graphics, the sound, everything was better than any game they had at the arcade. I mean, that was just absolutely incredible. It was like the first time that ever happened. And then, of course, with the Sega Saturn, you know, I'll give the Sega Saturn some love. I remember playing Virtua Fighter on the Saturn. I remember when they had Virtua Fighter 2 on the Saturn. It was amazing that they were able to even get that game to run on the Saturn and look as good as it did. And the Saturn had some really good games. The Saturn's an overlook system, especially a lot of the games that come from Japan, a lot of the classic shooters that are available on the Sega Saturn. But I was always jumping on whatever the new bandwagon was. Oh, I have a story to tell you guys. The Nintendo 64. So check this out. Back when the Nintendo 64 was coming out, a buddy of mine worked for this computer company where they sold monitors, and he was able to sign up for E3. And so me and him went to E3. This was, I think, I think this was the second E3. It was the E3 that happened in 1996. I went there to Los Angeles. I saw Shigeru Miyamoto. I was standing like maybe 25 feet away from Shigeru Miyamoto. He brought in a class like from somewhere in the Los Angeles area. A, a school bus full of little kids came in to show them Mario 64. I was waiting in line to see Mario 64, to play Mario 64. And they basically said, sorry, everybody, everybody's going to have to wait another like half an hour because we're bringing in Shigeru Miyamoto is leading in a class of children to check out his masterpiece, Mario 64. And I was there. I mean, I witnessed it. One of the greatest gaming moments ever. I remember when I first got my hands on Mario and I saw the freaking tree, just jumping Mario into the tree and climbing up the tree and Yahoo! you know, jumping out of the tree and little leaves falling out of the tree. It looked like a cartoon. It was unbelievable. Nintendo freaking killed it with the Nintendo 64 in the very beginning. Now, ultimately, the Nintendo 64 had a ton of problems and I could do a whole show on that, but but it was next level in the very beginning. Wave Race, do you guys remember Wave Race? The, the waves were just so freaking cool. Mario was cool. I remember Pilot Wings. Um, a lot of great games on the Nintendo 64 pretty early on. Okay, so then I made a jump to PC gaming. So this happened. Let me tell you guys my PC gaming story real quick. Up to this point, okay, so this is 1996, I believe. So up until 1996, I had never touched any PC game anything. The, old, the closest I ever got to PC gaming was way back that Atari 800XL. I was not a PC gamer at all. But I had a good buddy. His name is Walt, okay? And so Walt one time called me up and said, dude, you've got to come over to my house. You've got to see this. You're going to be blown the F away. And so I drove over to my boy Walt's house. I went and visited him, right? And so he brings me into this room and he has a computer monitor there. And on the screen is Tomb Raider. The very first Tomb Raider, a game that I had played on my PlayStation, but this was Tomb Raider like I had never seen it before. It was running on a 3DFX graphics card. It looked freaking magical, looked absolutely incredible, looked so much better than the PlayStation 1 version. And this is the birth of Anthony the Graphics Whore. This created Basically, seeing that Laura Croft Tomb Raider on his computer monitor, his ViewSonic, beautiful ViewSonic computer monitor, like top of the line, this dude worked at a freaking monitor shop, right? And he's running Tomb Raider on a 3DFX PC. And so he taught me the ropes, told me how to build my own PC, helped me build. I remember my very first PC, I had a Pentium 200 MMX, I think it was called was the processor. That was my first processor. And I had a 3DFX Voodoo graphics card. And that was my first graphics card. And I remember playing um, Jedi Knight, Jedi Forces 2 Jedi Knight. Oh man, that game was so freaking awesome on the PC. I remember playing G Police. I remember playing all kinds of different games on the PC at that time. But the game that blew me the freak away 
was the very first Unreal. You guys know Epic Games, of course, with Robo Recall. Well, my very first exposure with Epic Games was the very first Unreal. And I'm not talking about the Unreal Tournament. I'm not talking about Unreal Tournament. I'm talking about the very first Unreal. It was like a single player game, kind of like Doom. You know, you had Doom and you had Quake and Quake 2. Well, Unreal was like a continuation of Quake and taking it to a whole new level. Once again, visuals, production value, stuff that we had never seen before happened in Unreal. These flashing lights, the noise, just the atmosphere of everything. Epic Games absolutely freaking killed it with Unreal on the PC, especially if you had really a high-end rig. And back at this time, I was a crazy nut. I was buying, like I was every six months, I would buy a new graphics card. And basically every 10 months, I was probably buying a new processor and putting in a new motherboard. It was constantly a race to try to get a few extra frames or a, a little bit of a higher resolution, bump up the resolution a little bit. I remember this game called Moto GP. I think it was the first Moto GP on a computer. Looked so freaking drop dead gorgeous. I mean, this was the game that just made your computer look insane. I remember the first Half-Life. Talked about this in a recent episode with Valve, of course. I was there, bro, in 1998, the very first Half-Life. I was there. I played Half-Life at launch, man. I experienced the dream playing Unreal and Half-Life, I think, in the same calendar year. Incredible, just amazing. And so I was actually a PC gamer all of 1997, all of 1998, all of 1999. Now, what happened was in September of 1999, the Sega Dreamcast came out and I decided I've always been a console guy. You know, I'm a console gamer by heart, right? And Sega killed it with the Dreamcast. They really did. Like right at launch, they had so many great games on the Dreamcast. So I jumped back on the console bandwagon. I ended up getting a Dreamcast. Then the next year, the PlayStation 2 came out. I ended up getting that. And then the next year after that, it was the original Xbox and the GameCube. And I got all of those. And so during this time, I was console gamer. I was 100% console gamer during all of this time, had some amazing moments on all of these systems, especially the original Xbox. I really remember playing a lot of super cool games on that original Xbox, kind of a little bit of a snob maybe over like the PlayStation 2 because I was like, oh, it always looks better on the Xbox. You know, it always looks so much better. So I was always playing the games on the Xbox. And then, of course, Xbox 360 came out and PlayStation 3 came out and I was still in the video game world. And then it was right around, it was 2011, I jumped back to PC gaming. And the main reason I jumped back to PC gaming was I had been playing Fallout 3 on my Xbox 360, but I heard about these people, they were playing it on their PC and they're like, oh, dude, it looks incredible on the PC, all these high-res textures. Look at the road. Look at the difference of how good the road looks. I remember just seeing pictures of the road with the high-def texture pack and pictures of the road without the high-def texture pack, and it was freaking night and day. So I jumped on the PC bandwagon. I built myself a kick-ass PC. This was 2011, and I was a PC gamer all the way up until November 2013, and in November 2013, that's when the Xbox One and PlayStation 4 came out, and I jumped back on the console bandwagon. And so basically, that kind of brings us back to where we are today. And so uh, I, I want to wrap this up real quick because I know this is a long show, but you guys get a feel for my history, where I've been with some of these games, and, and I'm definitely giving you the condensed version. I could spend probably five hours talking about this stuff, but I was an Xbox uh, One gamer and a PS4 gamer, but I'll tell you what, it didn't do anything for me, man. It was just better graphics. It didn't do a hell of a lot. I was disappointed. I started to get disillusioned for a little while there. I almost thought 
I'm going to give up video gaming altogether. In fact, I went to retro gaming. I started becoming a retro gamer and I started reliving those memories of Super Mario World and those memories of Contra 3 Alien Wars and and Super Castlevania. And I went back and was playing Donkey Kong Country and, and Kid Chameleon on the Sega Genesis and Sonic the Hedgehog. I became a retro gamer because I was so freaking bored of modern gaming. And then guess what came? The HTC Vive. Da da! The HTC Vive came along. I found out about room scale. This whole idea of VR just captured my attention. I remember I listened to a podcast. It was a giant bomb podcast where Brad Shoemaker had been at, um, I don't remember if it was E3 or what show he was at, but he had an interview with John Carmack. And this is when Carmack was first working with Palmer Lucky. And this was when the Oculus thing first freaking started. And when we first found out that VR was going to make a comeback, and that's how I, I got excited about that. I started listening about it, but it was kind of like a curiosity. I wasn't really that into it. But then when the HTC Vive came out at, um, I think it was Barcelona, right? The Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, and they announced the room scale idea. And then a lot of uh, journalists, a lot of podcasters got to get demos of being in the lab and, and playing some of the stuff in the lab. And they were just freaking blown away. They had seen something new, something magical. That One of those things where you, you experience something, you're like, yes, this is a dream. This is some next level type shit. And so seeing all of that, I got jazzed and I, I took a chance and I said, what the hell? I'm going to just order one of these things. I threw caution to the wind, spending way more much way more money than I ever thought I would spend buying that original HTC Vive. I threw caution to the wind. I got an HTC Vive and my whole world changed. I was doing a retro gaming podcast. There's a podcast called Retro Blast, a 90s gaming retrospective. I used to do a retro gaming podcast and I quit. I quit doing that podcast and I apologized to my listeners because I told them, I said, you know what? I just don't have the desire to do this anymore because I fell in love with something different. I fell in love with VR, the possibilities of VR. And it started with that HTC Vive in April of 2016. That's where it all started. Got PlayStation VR in October of that year. And then it was uh, it was Summer of Rift is when I got my Rift. When the first day that we heard of Summer of Rift, I drove to Best Buy and got my Rift. And, and so basically that brings us to where we are now. And so anyway, guys, I hope maybe this was slightly interesting. It's interesting to me because this was my gaming history condensed into 30 minutes of discussion. And I left out so many details, so many cool stories I could possibly touch upon. But anyway, just thought I would throw this out there as kind of a special bonus especially to you guys that have been down with the daily vlog since the early episodes of the vlog, and you've followed us all along all the way to episode 65. Yeah, this is episode 65, so my OCD inclinations will be taken care of. Monday's episode will be episode 66, and I will get back to VR on Monday. And I'm going to let you guys know, Monday I am going to talk about my absolute favorite games, of 2017, but I'm going to try to talk about them in a little bit of a different way. And so I'm going to take a look at my favorite games of 2017, but I'm going to look at it in their importance to the VR industry and, and what kind of, what were the most important games of 2017? That's actually what I'm going to take a look at in Monday's episode, assuming that there isn't an explosion of news. I would love that. I'm, I'm definitely looking for the time when we get some more explosions of news, but probably not going to happen. But anyway, see you guys on Monday. Hope you like this episode. Thank you so much for uh, watching the channel. Thanks for all the good words. Everybody that has been leaving the comments, truly appreciate that. And if you haven't subscribed, definitely go ahead, subscribe to this show, like the video, and tell a buddy about it. If you know somebody that is into VR, if they've got any one of the three major systems, tell them about this show because... I am going to continue to bring it on a daily basis 
when it comes to VR gaming news and notes and just all my takes on VR gaming. And I I have no plans to go anywhere. So you need to get used to this because I'm not going anywhere. All right, guys. So that's going to do it. Episode 65 of VR Game Rankings Daily Vlog Series. Everybody have a wonderful Sunday. Seahawks, come on, baby. We need this. We need to get into the playoffs. And that's going to do it. Everybody take it easy. Later. Later.